Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City for AI Leaders East Coast Edition. Earlier, two months ago, we did it in Silicon Valley, connecting Silicon Valley and Wall Street with the NYSE Wired Communities with theCUBE together, connected and bringing all this content value. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Obviously, we're at the balcony above the New York Stock Exchange, our East Coast location at the NYSE. Cody Coleman, CEO, Coactive.ai. Cody, great to see you. I just saw you at the Madrona event, the IA40, which is their signature event. They do a study every year. You were a presenter of one of the AI innovators. Congratulations. Um, Stanford PhD comes into AI, makes a natural progression. Um, great to see you. And congratulations on the uh, speaking at the event. Yeah, thank you, John. It's All right, great so, to see you. So again. you've been on the road. You were just I heard when you came in that you were at the, in LA for the Tech Week. Was that the yep. A16Z uh, kind of event? How'd that go? Oh, it was awesome. It was awesome. So I mean, LA Tech Week is like a massive event. So you know, A16Z is one part of it. You know, I was actually super fortunate to be able to kick off um, LA Tech Week with AWS on a panel at Amazon Studios. So it was just awesome to see kind of how the creative. Mm -hmm. atmosphere and energy of LA is actually coming in and embracing technology and specifically AI. What was the vibe of the show? Share your thoughts on what the vibe was like there. You know, the vibe of, the, of LA Tech Week was, um, you know, I think a lot of people are curious about AI. You know, we've kind of gone over, or maybe taken a step back. When I think about AI kind of broad adoption, mm -hmm. you know, it happened like less than two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, in 2022, ChatGPT was released and everyone was like, you know, rushing towards AI. And what we saw was that in 2023, there's like a massive kind of rush towards AI in terms of consumer and things like that. But in media entertainment, so especially in LA, there was a lot of fear mm -hmm. around that. You know, you had the, the writers, uh, uh, writers and actors on strike and things like that. Um, and even going into 2024. And now, now that 2024 has actually hit us, it's actually starting to yep. see this kind of acceptance and embrace of, of AI. And it's going from like this existential yeah. threat to something that actually is um, critical for being able to produce content more efficiently, especially now that we need to produce more content than ever. Yeah, it's interesting. You see people here, I hear words like, we now have clear line of sight on blank or whatever they're in. So you start to see people get it, they understand where they can apply it, they know how to get into it, and there's a kind of at least a path. Um, clearly some of the stuff's still out there, agentic systems, which we've been covering a lot of on SiliconANGLE and the Cube Research, uh, still down the road. But yeah. you know, we're seeing the preparation, the progression's happening, uh, and it reminds me of the web, online population grows and functionality gets better, so the adoption will drive certainly more capability. Obviously the chips are getting better, faster, cheaper, yeah. um, clustered systems. So that's great news. Let's talk about your company because you know, you know, we've had lunch together, we had multiple conversations about what you're working on. Yeah. LA and New York, two big markets for what you do, media, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're doing some really cool stuff in AI. Again, you know, we're at Stanford, you've been in the machine learning, you've been in the AI world, you know a lot of the folks who wrote the papers, uh, involved in some of the deep learning tech. But now that it starts to bust out on the scenes, you got your startup, um, and a lot more opportunities are coming your way and happening. Yeah. So give a quick overview of what you guys do real quick for the folks who don't know, and then we'll get into some of the AI stuff that you're working on. Awesome, awesome. So fundamentally at Coactive, what, we're, what we've created is a, a platform or almost an operating system for content that makes it easy to search and analyze images and videos. And you know, taking a step back, when we think about kind of what is happening right now with, with AI, um, you know, the internet, as you mentioned, the web, it, it democratized content distribution. Mm -hmm. And now with AI, we actually have the ability to democratize content creation. And there's just a huge push to produce more content than ever. You know, um, you know the fact that we have, you know, every single one of us has a camera in our pocket now, the fact that it's become so easy to capture information and things like that. But the challenge is, despite the fact that we've made it so easy and cheap to capture content, to create content, it's still difficult to do, you know, even the most fundamental and basic things with content. You know, for example, um, we focus a lot in retail and media entertainment, and we were talking with one large, you know, food company, and they actually have 4,000 photos of strawberries. <laughs> Just strawberries, you know, and it wasn't because they were trying to find like, you know, the strawberries good side or the right angle. It's because they couldn't find the other fourth or the other 3,999 photos of strawberries that they had already taken. And then the same thing happens in media. 
Yeah. It's cheaper for a production company to hire a helicopter and a photographer to take you know, photos and videos of the New York skyline than it is to find the assets they already have. And the challenge there is that it's been like an incredibly manual process up to this point yeah. where enterprises have had to you know, tag their raw assets, either through human or machine annotations, yeah. load those annotations into their systems as metadata, and search based off of that, which is an incredibly slow, expensive, and inflexible process that barely scales to the content that we're producing today. And with the rise of generative AI, it just won't be able to keep up anymore. Yeah. And that's where Coactive comes in. What we're fundamentally doing is that we're leveraging the recent advances in, in AI, specifically multimodal AI, to flip that process on its head and go from this world of tag load search to being able to load and index your raw assets and make them searchable with no metadata, no tags required, and then also being able to power all of your other downstream processes in a highly scalable and secure way. Yeah, it's, it's like you're taking the productivity gain, but also putting a platform in place to make the service better. Yes, yes. So what's it, how's it going so far? Who are you talking to? Give us some examples of other customers. Who are you meeting with? What are some of the conversations? Yeah, so we focus on three large verticals right now. So there's community and social platforms. So one of our customers is Fandom, where we actually help them do trust and safety. So Fandom is the world's largest uh, fan-generated um, content and entertainment platform in the world with about 350 million active users, monthly users. Um, previously, they had to like review every single image that was uploaded to Fandom to see if it actually satisfied their community guidelines. With Coactive, they were able to codify those guidelines, take their process that took them you know, 24, 48 hours down to 250 milliseconds for that first review, reduce their overall um, cost by 50% in 30 days. Additionally, we also end up focusing on retail companies and media companies, so we're working with large Fortune 500 um, uh, retail and media companies. There, what we see is, you know, both in retail, you know, one of, our, one of our customers, they use this for their marketing platform. You know, these retail companies, they have millions of assets, they're producing hundreds of thousands of assets every single season in order to capture the latest trends and latest lineup but they struggle to find even the most basic things, like strawberries. Yep. So there we can come in, we can actually index and ingest all their content, make it searchable in less than a second. And then we can do the same thing in media and entertainment, but we can actually take it a step further. So we're actually working with uh, a massive media and entertainment company, Fortune 500, Fortune 50, um, where we actually help them uh, generate minute by minute cut sheets so they can take their ratings information and they can join that, that metadata that we generate at a minute by minute level and join that with ratings data so that they can improve their content week over week and day over day. So you data to impact content story creation. Yes, yeah. So talk about the, uh, the dynamic that's going on between um, assets, content is assets, yeah. and workflows. Because yeah. what you're getting at here is you're attacking the efficiency of the asset development and consumption and the workflows involved in getting the asset. Yeah. That seems to be the secret flywheel here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's actually, you know, making assets live up to their name because in actuality, when you think about images and videos at these enterprises, it actually ends up being more of a tax on the organization mm -hmm. than a real asset because when we think about image and video data, just storing the data is like an incredible, it's super expensive because of the sheer volume that image and video data takes up. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, for example, I, I always love this kind of a, a analogy. You know, when you think about, you know, big data today, it's, you know, largely structured data. You know, tabular data, think an Excel spreadsheet. And 10 million rows of tabular data, that's roughly 40 megabytes. You think about 10 million documents, like 10 million pages from Wikipedia, now you're talking 40 gigabytes. That's three orders of magnitude different. That's like going from the surface area of Lake Tahoe to the surface area of the Caspian Sea. Yeah. <laughs> now take me through the, the um, scope and magnitude of how to get started. So let's just say that I'm a media entertainment company, um, could be sports, could be something else. How do I engage? What's the engagement that you have with the customer? What's, take us through the process. Are there mechanisms involved? Is there deployment scenarios? Take us through how you guys engage. 
Yeah. So our goal is to you know, make it easy to search and analyze visual content. So we actually meet our customers where they are at today. So by and large, when you think about image and video assets, they're stored in some form of blob storage. So if it's in the cloud, that might be something like S3 or Google Storage Bucket. Um, and that's kind of where they're sitting at today. And then actually getting that through the entire workflows into their systems, whether it be for analytics or for dams, there's a lot of work that goes into it. But we've strived to make it really simple and easy. And it's a three-step process. So first, you know, people give us you know, a, a name for their data and they can carve it up into a bunch of different kind of setups depending on their organizational structure and depending on the data. Then they point us to where it exists, you know, whether that's in the cloud or it can be like even you know, a CSV of URLs. And the last and most important step is that they give us permission, read permission to access that data. Um, and it's revocable at any point in time because from the very beginning, you know, these are called assets, these are IP. Yep. It's actually really critical to the business that they're protected. So we've invested in data privacy and security from the very beginning. So they give us read, um, read permission to their assets that they can revoke any time. And then the, uh, the system, Coactus platform, does all the heavy lifting. Everything from pre-processing those raw image and video assets to actually uh, to prepare them to be applied, uh, to prepare them for kind of ingestion and indexing by you know, a foundation model, by an ML model, to you know, doing that process in a highly scalable and distributed way, to actually you know, making sure that the artifacts are in the right you know, data system for them, whether it be you know, storing it in an object store, storing it uh, metadata in a relational database, no relational database, or a vector database, yeah. and then connecting it through our APIs to their actual end-to-end -end workflow. On the customer um, productivity gain, what is the main value proposition? Just kind of cleaning house, getting the foundation set. You come in, look at their assets first, you assess. Do you then give them a recommendation or is there usually a predetermined workflow and workload? Yeah, so, so with our customers, we see them you know, driving value in a variety of ways, reducing risk like in the case of fandom, where they can take down this problematic content so that they provide a better experience to their communities and also ultimately can advertise against that content in those pages. In the case of um, you know, a marketing team and a, for a retail company, we're saving them from having to spend tens of thousands of dollars to go out and do completely new photo shoots because of the fact that they can find the assets that they already have. And then in the case of media entertainment, you know, where we can help them you know, figure out how to improve their content week over week or day over day, we're actually driving top line. Yeah. Um, and in another case, you know, we're actually even helping people do content licensing, you know, where yeah. it directly like the, the more content that you can find, the more, uh, yeah. more content that you can sell and ultimately the more money that you can make on it. You know, what I like, what I like about your business, Cody, is that assets and workflows where the value is, you're essentially allowing them to merchandise their assets exactly. in a way that's efficient. But now the, the front lines, whether you call it the creatives or the business folks, can deploy without worrying about lag. Exactly. Like the lag involved in just retrieval. Hey, where's that video file someone <laughs> shot? Ah, uh, shit, I got through that freaking, which drive is it in? <laughs> or which cloud is it in? I mean, there's a lot of that going on. 100%, yeah. yeah. And, okay, so where, where are the, what is it like for you right now? Let's talk about the, your entrepreneurial journey because you know, right now you're living the dream. You're yeah. um, on stage at all the events. Um, you're with a lot of the power players. Um, but you got a business to build. You yeah. got some funding. Yeah. Your milestone is get the next round, get some traction, product market fit. Um, what's the journey been like for you? And take us through where you are in the progression. Yeah, I mean, it's been an incredible journey for me. Um, you know, it's been a dream since I, I was a little kid. I was like one of those kids that, um, you know, I'm a nerd at heart. I was glued yeah. to the Science Channel, the Discovery <laughs> Channel growing up and just love the idea of building something that would have an impact on society. And then I was super fortunate to go and do my PhD at Stanford where um, I was advised by Matei Zaharia. Yeah. So Matei is well known for creating, you know, Data Spark, Spark, Data Bricks, Data yeah. Bricks. he's a genius. <laughs> Cube yeah. alumni, by the way, you know, great guy. Matei, good to see you. Yeah. Exactly, and it, and it was great working with, uh, with Matei in order to like actually you know, understand from him how to think about technology and also to think about you know, how do you go about this process of doing category creation. Because you know, fundamentally what we're doing at Coactive is that we're really trying to unlock the value of these images and videos and turn it from being a tax on organization into an asset that generates new revenue streams. So that journey, it's been interesting because um, you know, taking a step back in time, we started in 2021. You know, I defended my PhD on June 7, 2021, uh, took yeah. Friday and Monday off, and then we were off to the races. But back then, no one cared yeah. about AI. 
and no one knew about embedding vectors. We talked to VCs and we were like, you know, we want to do this kind of embedding based approach to yeah. being able to process content based off of the experiences that I had working at Pinterest and Meta. And VCs were like, you know, who cares about embedding vectors, you know? Yeah. Fast and by the way, back then it was mostly a fight about, you know, undesirable content or spam or, yeah. you know, some sort of thing that you had to clean the mess up. Yeah. It wasn't a proactive issue, but the tech is still the same. Yeah. I mean, this is kind of the background. Facebook Meta, I mean, they spent tons of tech on that. Pinterest, same thing. Exactly. That's where the original inspiration was because, you know, my whole PhD was trying to democratize AI. Because yeah. back in 2016 when I started, I could see the future. Yeah. I could see that intelligent applications uh, were the future and that AI would power, you know, the workflows, the, you know, applications of the future. But the, the problem back then, and we're still facing yeah, yeah. that now, is that the barrier to being able to create those applications was so high. Yeah. And it was awesome to see, you know, at, um, at Pinterest and at Meta, how they were actually able to, you know, leverage AI in mm -hmm. order to drive business value with their content. Whether that was, you know, recommendations, search, advertising, analytics, you know, copyright protection, yeah. protecting the safety of online communities. But what I also saw is that it took a tremendous amount of resources in order to do that. You know, first in terms of human resources, so a bunch of PhDs <laughs> like my co-founder and I, as well as computational resources yeah. to be able to process this data at this scale. You know, images and video are like, six orders of magnitude larger than uh, the tabular data of the big data movement thus far. It's like going yeah. from like the surface area over Lake Tahoe to the surface area yeah. on the Pacific Ocean. I mean, Ocean. the petabytes and the zettabytes are off the charts because your surface area, as you said, it's also harder to ingest that. You yeah. need horsepower. Yeah. You need a lot of cash. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you guys have a big CapEx budget? Are you using the cloud? What's the, what's the back end look like for you guys? Yeah, so, you know, that's a really great point. So during my PhD, I was actually um, able to see the front lines of computer systems. So my dissertation, of, of course, was even called Resource and Data Efficient Deep Learning. So thinking about how we can do this very efficiently, and I was super fortunate to be one of the co-creators of MLPerf. Yeah. I created a precursor called Dawnbench and was able to see just like, you know, how expensive <laughs> training and inference, you know, were on you these You can things. get a dollar for every download of MLPerf. You'd be a zillionaire right now. <laughs> By the way, congratulations. I always love that project. That was a success. Oh, yeah, thank I just always you. like to point that out. It's really, that's definitely impacted a lot of developers. So, you know, yeah. good. Again, this is the point in time. But at that time, that was tooling. Things are getting going. Okay. Developers are hot, now you have now platform specific scale. Yeah. So this is what I like about what you're working on. You've taken on a hard problem. Yeah, yeah. From a data size perspective, never mind the, the, the business logic behind it. Yeah. I mean, that's a big issue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the data processing, again, is, is, is incredibly like difficult. You know, it's like, uh, when we think about the tools that we have today for like data lakes versus like, you know, data oceans of visual content, it's like having a rowboat or a canoe, you know, it's fine for crossing like a lake, but if you told me to cross the Pacific Ocean, I'd say you're crazy yeah, yeah. that you need a bigger boat. And that's fundamentally what we're building at Coactive is that bigger boat. But, you know, in addition to that complexity, just from the sheer systems and scalability piece of it, yeah. you also have the, the fact that AI is evolving so rapidly. So actually from like the very beginning, we decided to take a model agnostic approach. You know, rather than building kind of a base foundation model, we designed our system to be modular so that we could actually keep up with the rapid pace of, of AI development. Because, you know, even back in, in 2018, there was um, this awesome blog post from OpenAI about AI and compute, where they made um, a comparison back to, uh, you know, the 70s or 80s when, you know, computer chips were improving every 18 to 24 months, we were doubling the amount of computation that we had, and Moore's Law was created. They saw the same doubling happening when they looked at the amount of um, floating point operations in these training models, where it was doubling not every 18 to 24 months, it was doubling every uh, 3.4 months. Basically, roughly every quarter, the amount of computation that was going into these foundation models was doubling. And you know, I think we should call it you know, Altman's Law after yeah, that. Yeah. And we've seen it play out since you know, yeah. the study was started in 2012 to where we are today, where these models have gone from you know, thousands and millions of parameters to tens of billions of parameters and more. You know, I, I, um, I always say tokens are like electricity for AI, they run everything. The innovation and in, in cost per token has been plummeting. Yeah. Context windows are opening up on number of tokens. 
um, the number of parameters are in the trillions yeah. now. So the, on the consumer side, the large language foundation models are getting bigger. Computer vision is hot right now too, starting to see yeah. that. Now you have the small language models in the enterprise where you have like these domain specific assets like video, audio, et cetera, that are multimodal, have to be also ingested in yeah. and connected into the other models. Um, how do you see that market emerging? Because you know, at some point the data has to start talking to each other. Yeah. Um, I have to index things specifically. I mean, we've seen on our cube business in 2021, we moved everything over into neural network format with vector embeds. Yep. Again, we didn't have to pitch anyone because we don't have any investors, but <laughs> yeah. um, th we knew that we wanted to have a content creation vehicle for the video that would be easy to help us produce content faster. Yeah. A simple use case, but now it's opening up more avenues. What are you seeing when you start seeing your customers start to identify this need for value unlocking? And two, once they get there, Everyone seems to have an aha moment. Well, I have other stuff too. Yeah. What are you seeing there? Because I like the, I like the fact that there's low hanging fruit easily to get some productivity gains. Yeah. But then when they realize they have a scalable platform, they usually pop up with a, wow, I can do this now too. What are some of those things that you're seeing on your side? Because that, that really was where the dots connect with the customer. Like, okay, okay, pilot worked. This is great. Yeah. Now I want to apply it to blank. What are, what are some of those conversations? Yeah, that's a great point. You know, because it's 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 such a special moment right now because it used to be that as humans we saw the world through vision and machines saw the world through bytes. But because of AI, those worlds are blurring together and machines can finally see the world like we do. And that's giving us a whole new set of superpowers when we think about the enterprise and the customers that we serve. You know, being able to find a, a clip, a piece of content in less than a second, not hours or days. You know, being able to, you know, almost uh, develop a, a, a spidey sense to detect content that violates you know, the safety of online communities or editorial guidelines, um, to of course being able to turn these uh, images and videos from attacks on an organization into an asset and new revenue streams. So we really see kind of like, you know, initially like, um, you know, for us people will see the kind of night and day difference in terms of search or the fact that they can now, you know, bring structure to their unstructured data and that opens up a whole world of possibilities where we see these, you know, these enterprises pulling us into a bunch of different things. You know, they might start out with images and then they want to process video. We're seeing people where you know, we start with this like, content engagement, but then their advertising team is like, hey, let's take all of these <laughs> commercials that we have and like, you know, create a predictive thing to say, yeah. like, you know, is it yeah. better to have the, the logo of the brand and the commercial at the, the first third, the middle third, or the last third of like, the commercial in order to drive engagement and to be able to give people feedback um, in, the, uh, in the content that they're creating. So it's opening up kind of a new set of, of, of superpowers as the digital world and the physical world are now blurring together. Yeah. Well, Cody, great to have you on theCUBE, great to yeah. see you, and congratulations on your success. And I, I still think that you're in this small little beachhead that will grow like this because multimodal exactly. media is going to be the lingua franca. Now that we can speak machine <laughs> yeah. language, yeah. basically through prompts and soon to be voice, yeah. find me that picture of the strawberry, the yeah. best one that I like. Exactly, <laughs> then, exactly. Not the exactly. one that my colleague likes, the one I like, the one from the side. Yeah, and this is where it starts to get really cool. And I think you guys are on something really big. Uh, great to see you. Thanks for coming yes. on theCUBE. Thanks Thank for you. coming to our East Coast AI leaders with the NYSE Wired, Brian's team there. It's great stuff. Thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thanks I'm John Furrier here on theCUBE. We are at the NYSE above the on the balcony above the show floor. A closing bell will be coming in a few, an hour and a half, so we'll hear it, we'll, we'll get that for you. And of course, all the best content here on the East Coast in New York City. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.